come into my studio, Paul Clements. And Paul and I go back an awfully long way in BBC. <laughs> we worked together in Radio Current Affairs over the years with responsibilities in Good Morning Ulster, PM Ulster, and Newsbreak in the middle of the day. That's right, yes. It was a yes. constancy of bad news, wasn't it, It was Paul? pretty bad in those days, 1980s, yeah, the height of the troubles, really. And uh, every day brought some uh, depressing news. That's right, that's right. I often say that my great uh, cross that I carried through the troubles was that my agenda every my culinary agenda for breakfast every morning so to speak was the list of those who died overnight I know, it was I know. Awful it's a tragic call. time came it was. Through, it was awful now you have done a great thing your book here on Richard Hayward before I even open it it's got a lovely feel to it it's a beautiful book it's a quality production and Hayward you discovered was a man of great skill in the world of writing, in the world of theatre, telling tales, discovered... Uh, who was it he discovered? Delia Murphy, Delia the Murphy. singer. Yep. He was yep. a scout for Decca. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the point we start <laughs> with the story of Richard Hayward. Well, the singing is a great side to him, Rowan. Uh, as a boy, he grew up in... in uh, when the family moved to Ireland, they, they lived in O'Meath in County Louth briefly, and then he moved to Larne. He was brought up in Larne in the 1890s. And Larne was a very uh, rumbunctious place in those days. All the steamers were coming to and from Scotland. The tours were opening up to the glens of Antrim, Henry McNeil's tours. Hayward would have heard ballad singers on the streets of Larne and storytellers, and as he called them, religious fanatics too, <laughs> and dancers at fair days and all this. He actually heard Percy French singing in the streets of Larne. So that had a tremendous impact. And they, the family had a maid servant who came from County Monaghan. She sang traditional Irish songs in Irish and English, and that that had a big influence on him as a young boy. He then set about in later years collecting Irish songs and some orange ballads as well and recorded them with Decca and HMV. And in later years, he discovered Delia Murphy at a meeting in Dublin of Ju in Jury's Hotel of the Pen Club. He heard her wonderful singing voice. She was unknown then. She later became known as the Queen of Connemara. And yes, she essentially yeah. was Ireland's first celebrity woman singer. And Richard Hayward discovered her, signed her up and recorded with her in London with Decca. Where did your literary love affair with Hayward begin? Well, I read a lot of, uh, I do my own travel scribbling and travel books about Ireland, as I call it. In the 1980s, we were talking about the 80s there, in between reporting the news, I was reading Hayward's travel books. And I realized the amount of detail that you could learn about Ireland from reading those books, and particularly, Rowan, an Ireland long gone. The, those middle decades of the 20th century, the 30s, 40s, 50s, Ireland was a completely different world, obviously. Hayward captured that in his travel books. Those books are, are wonderful little, I call them um, medi thoughtful meditations on an older Ireland. And if you want to know what Ireland was like, they're great books to read. He was a fluent, intelligent writer. Uh, he was funny. There's a bit of humor. He was outspoken about the buildings, for example, was one thing that we, we didn't protect our built heritage in Ireland. Here in Newry, in Dublin, in Limerick, they didn't care about the Georgian buildings falling into dilapidation. That was a big thing for him that he complained about. We weren't yeah. interested in protecting the, the buildings. And some of the, look, look, in praise of Ulster, where the River Shannon flows, this is Ireland, Leinster and the city of Dublin. This is Ulster and the city of Belfast, Mayo, Sligo, Leitrim, Roscommon. Uh, this is Ar Connacht Con Con to Galway, the Kingdom of Kerry, the Corrib country. It's just all uh, of Ireland was his territory. And there's more, more of it. There's, there's more, more of the back and, the, and the orange and ballads too. What did he come to Ireland from England? Because he realised that from a literary point of view, Ireland offered. A, a, a great opportunity for his writing. Well, he was very young, actually. He was only he was only a, a young boy of two or three years of age. His father was a, a, a great yachtsman and a sailor, and he wanted to join the sailing clubs. He'd set up sailing clubs in Southport, Lancashire, and in North Wales, and he wanted to join clubs around Belfast, Loch and Larne to be, to be there for the mm. sailing, mm -hmm. and he ran a marine engineering business in Belfast. So that was the sailing background to his father, and he just became in, uh, really, really in, interested in Ireland and its cultural history and everything to do with with the past yeah. and wanted to write about it he wanted to put his English past behind him in fact he tried to disguise it wow. in one birth certificate I have seen he claims he was born in Larne uh, in 1893 he wasn't he was born in Southport Lancashire he in 1892 was, yeah. but he wanted to hide the English background 
So you, you, you discovered him and you've been, you, lots and lots of interviews over 10 years perhaps writing the book. Uh, very intensive for the last five years, Rowan, but going to archives all over Ireland, give you one example. Uh, Morris Walsh, the author of The Quiet Man, yes. uh, his archives at the University of Limerick. So I went down to Limerick to explore that for a couple of days. Hayward had a great connection to The Quiet Man. He wasn't in the film, but his uh, the version of his song the humor is on me now famous oh, yeah. song was used I in the will film i must get married exactly. for the humor is on <laughs> me now and there's a wonderful photograph in the back of maureen o'hara back of that, that is, that on is. the set of the quiet man reading corob country Mad. which some people have said to me there'd be a few cynics about hayward you know some people have said to me he was probably floating around and plunked the book into her hand for a bit of publicity oh yeah of course <laughs> of course he did that but listen to me there's no one writing books like this these days unless you are mr clements well mine's not the same style as, as Hayward, I have to say, um, I wouldn't have his skills or his detailed historical knowledge. But I do write books about Ireland, and I have uh, explored the mountains and the landscape of Ireland and the Burren and the west of Ireland. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've been influenced by him to an extent in that I learned what you could do within the parameters of travel writing, Rowan, yes. because there's enormous elasticity in terms of what you can put in there. Archaeology, architecture, b the buildings, the, that whole side of it, music, if you want to put it in, the food. Hayward, you can imagine, Ireland in the 1940s, the hotels were like flea pits. <coughs> yeah, you couldn't yeah. get a decent meal. Hayward said the best meal he got in Ireland was at the Adelphi Cinema Restaurant in Dundalk. <laughs> <laughs> and he made a film in, in Clockerhead. He did, uh, Irish and proud of it, with Dinah Sheridan, who was 15 years of age. There was another woman he discovered, she was a young girl then. Dinah Sheridan went on to appear in The Railway Children, and Genevieve became a world-famous actress. Hayward discovered her. Yeah. Where does it go from here? Is this you, uh, is this you done with... Richard Hayward. Have you it wrapped? Well, it? You, th you think you could be done with it, uh, Rowan, but since the book has come out a few months ago, people have written to me, they've sent me emails, they've sent me stories. It never really ends. Yes. This is what I wanted to achieve, the book and a BBC television documentary. There's a symposium in Belfast on them in October. It, it's really, uh, it, in a sense, the book has been the catalyst yes. for a huge amount of uh, information to now come out on them. And it has interested journalists and the press all over Ireland. Richard Hayward, was an Ulster man, but he was very much an Ireland, an All Ireland man. You see, you you were needed to do this. I'm looking at the sheer volume of his uh, of his work. No one was garnering this. No one was no, uh, no. making it available to the public who were waiting for it. Suddenly along comes yes. Paul Clements, and you did it. Well, well his, done. He, he fell. His, his, he fell into neglect after his death. He he, he disappeared almost. Uh, and the troubles played a big part in people forgetting about Richard Hayward. And four, uh, four or five years ago, I could see in the distance, Rowan, 2014 coming. And I set my sights on the 50th anniversary of his death because journalists, as you know, love an anniversary oh, pig. Yeah. And they can't get enough of that. And I could see, right, 50th anniversary, that was my deadline. Yeah. It was a five-year yeah. deadline, a long uh, time. But when you consider... I, I more I, than you had in, in <laughs> BBC it Radio. It was. But I explored upwards of 40 archives all over Ireland and in Britain, yeah. uh, Liverpool and Southport, the area he, he, he knew. Uh, I interviewed 50 people, either on the telephone or meeting them for a coffee, to get stories from them about Hayward. And to me, they're the, they're the people who bring him yeah. alive. It's not so much the dusty old archives. No. That's important. But I'll give you one example. Through the Belfast Naturalist Field Club, Hayward was a conductor of tours to Kilkenny, Killarney, the Corrib, the Burn. He took people all over Ireland in the 1950s when they knew nothing about the west of Ireland. People had never been there. They didn't have any cars. Yeah. He took them on bus tours. Shadowbanks. And the Shadowbanks, well, that was slightly earlier, but the, the bus coaches of the 50s. One man said to me, the women who went on those trips, they loved Richard Hayward. Wow. It didn't matter where he was going didn't matter what the destination was. They fought to get sitting beside him on the bus. Wow. They loved his company, they loved his crack, they loved his conversation. And they didn't want too much detail about no. the, the geological age of the glacial no, no, erratics no, no. in the borough. No, no. A little bit would do them. The glacial erratics <laughs> in the borough. So burrow. he gave them that. And as this man said to me, <sighs> this man said, and Hayward wasn't a scientist. This man said to me, if he didn't know it, he might have made it up. Of course. And that pleased him even more. Now, on the, on, on the reverse side of that, some of the academics did not like Hayward. Oh, he no. was too populist for yeah. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. He, they, 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 they didn't like that about him. And, and, you know, he, they felt he was too lightweight. Ah, yes. But yet, that didn't bother Richard Hayward. His public loved him. Oh, That's what mattered yeah. to him. Did any of the women marry him? Uh, one of them did, actually. He, wow. he was married. His first wife died of cancer in 1961, and he remarried a woman much younger. Um, uh, she only died seven or eight... Well, she died in 2005, yeah. uh, Dorothy. And she would have been on the field club trips. So yes. she was interested in Ireland. She might have one met of, him there. Um, one of the reasons as to why his name disappeared, this is cited as she was very possessive of his estate. She wow. wouldn't let anybody touch it. After he, after she died, the estate went to the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum at Coltrall, where I've explored it. They have the whole Richard Hayward archive in two big press cabinets, yes. all taken from his house. There was a bequest that she agreed to leave it. But the films that were made, for example, The Luck of the Irish, uh, Irish and proud of it. They were rotting in tin cans. Oh. They were actually, some of them were acetate, oh, which means yeah. if you touch them, they could explode Exa or yeah. nitrate. And her, her, well, her grandson and some of her family cite her as being the reason. We don't know the name Richard Hayward today. Yeah. Uh, it certainly played a part. She was extremely possessive of the man's estate. And in trying to protect his posthumous reputation, some people feel she actually killed it. You have yes. to remember, Rowan, this man was one of the most famous men in Ireland two generations ago. How did he disappear? Where did he go? That was what piqued my curiosity. Yeah. What happened to him? Yeah. Because when I read his travel books, I knew nothing about the man. Yes. Then later I discovered he made films, he was a stage actor of some renown, he was a singer, uh, he was a collector of Ulster dialect, he was a folklorist, everything about yeah. the man, uh, which was not... I was in awe of his versatility, yeah, of yeah. what he achieved. And if you take those films, the Luck of the Irish, which actually has been broadcast on the BBC after the documentary, the first time in 80 years has ever been shown on television. Yes. You can press your red button and watch it. They've got permission from the British Film Institute to show it once. They were low-budget, bucolic films. Yes. He had no foundation behind them. He had nobody supporting him. Look at Game of Thrones. How many millions go into that today? Yes. You put yourself in the context of the 1930s, and people knew nothing about the film world. Yeah. In Larn, the, the film part of that film in Glynn, there yeah. were hundreds of people turned up to say, what's all this about? They had to bring in an extra policeman from Larn <laughs> to control the crowd. <laughs> 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 well, listen to me. The, uh you, uh, what's your, you're working at the moment on what? Well, I work for Guidebooks to Ireland. I do an American guide called Fooders, very well known in the United States. I do Ireland, or part of Ireland for them, the North, the Midlands, and yes. Donegal, Sligo. And I've just completed the Rough Guide to Ireland. I have a couple of other projects bubbling, but at the moment, the... The, the amount of work went into that nearly overwhelmed me. I You're thought it was, I thought it was due arrest. Uh, yeah. But actually, what I'm doing is I'm doing a lot of talks now. I'm on my yeah. way to do talks this weekend in Dublin, Limerick, and at yeah. the Quiet Man Festival in Kong, where wow. Maureen O'Hara turned up three years Absolute ago. Way. Yes. Yeah, she yeah. turned up there at that. So I'm yeah. doing a talk there, promoting the book and the man and his memory and his legacy, because I think that is, that is the key yeah, thing. Absolutely. The legacy oh, of what absolutely. he achieved and what he has left us yeah. in the way of sound recordings, uh, of his of his records, his films, and his books. Okay. I mean, that's a tremendous legacy to have left is, behind. Course, and course. for that just to disappear, to me, would have been yeah. a tragedy. But as you say, maybe it was the Troubles <coughs> that did it. Two generations ago, he's the most famous in Ireland, not knowing about when you came to him no, uh, no. 10 years ago, yeah, whatever yeah, it yeah, was, yeah. and you see you to start and do it. But... Uh, it's, it's inconceivable that such a talent could have vanished off the face it of the It is amazing. Earth. Mind you, the Troubles did play a part, and this is Ireland. If you take this as Ireland, we love our cultural heroes. We love putting them up there on a pedestal, and we love knocking them off and then yeah, forgetting about them. Mark Twain once said, the great quote from Mark Twain, uh, somebody asked him how long is literary immortality, and he said it's 35 years, wow. which in his case, of course, was irrelevant because his mm. books are still in print Absolutely. and selling 100 Absolutely. years after he wrote them. But I think 35 to 40 years is probably about the length of time yes. we, we know these people. Although, mind you, you take the people from his, his era, Sean of Whelan, Frank yeah. O'Connor, yeah. uh, Morris Watts, we, yeah. we know them. Yeah. And Morris Watts, the quiet man, obviously, mm -hmm. we're not going to forget about him. Mm -hmm. But Hayward just disappeared. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said, those are the reasons cited the troubles, his second wife's what? possessiveness, and yeah. people's, people's desire to move on. The thing about it is, the songs he was recording in the 40s, 50s, 60s, all those brilliant songs by the bright silvery light of the moon, the stone outside Dan O'Hara's door, yeah. uh, six miles from Bangor to Donoghadee, wonderful songs. They, to me, Rowan, they're not old-fashioned. They will never, they will endure no, no, forever. Yeah, yeah. But 
what was old fashioned was the 78s he was recording them on yeah. and the monologues that he recorded with Jimmy O'D and Harry O'Donovan, two famous Dublin what? comedians. Mm -hmm. They people Jimmy couldn't play yeah. them and yeah. they became very old fashioned, yeah. you know, in, in that period. Yeah, and people yeah. moved then as well. Look, look at traditional Irish music, which was his big thing. You had the Wolf Tones, yeah. you had the Dubliners, and you had the Clancy Brothers yes. changing the face in the late 50s, early 60s. Hayward still plowed on through that. He died in 64, but it was the whole face of the musical world and of course the cultural world the Beatles everything was changing we have the opportunity to bring a name in here that you and I both know and we loved him greatly God love him uh, these things would make Dan Gilbert smile from ear to ear oh exactly Dan Gilbert would have probably uh, actually been very well aware of Hayward in yeah. his time and would have known him and would have would have appreciated what he did and his achievements Dan, Dan was Dan the Gilbert, head of yeah. radio current affairs in our day and a That's wonderful right. man he, he was, was a tremendous man yeah and there's and a, I think there's a memorial prize given to him isn't there, oh, there in, is in radio indeed. there is in the radio indeed. world yeah. Yeah. in the radio yeah. academy but yeah. Hayward you know Hayward was in at the start when the BBC was founded Exactly 90 years ago, autumn 20, yeah. 1924, Hayward was in there right from the start. Yeah. And with he his wife. He recognized with, with modernity his, and the, the benefits but, of it. But he was also innovative in what he was doing in, in the sound broadcasting yeah. world. Yeah. People knew nothing about what is radio. Yes. He didn't have crystal yes. sets. He was working with Tyrone Guthrie. His wife, Elma, was an actress. He recorded these little radio skits and comedy sketches with her. That was the 20s. Then opening night of Ulster Television, who was there? Richard Hayward. Hayward yeah. Lawrence Olivia handed over to Ireland's son with the minstrel hand, Richard Hayward. Richard Hayward. Opening night, always there. My goodness. Although that, I have to say, that annoyed some people. He was jumping around doing too many things. Some people oh, yeah. didn't like Hayward. What well, um, as a, as a human too, being, you've told me about his professionalism. As a human being, what kind of person was he? He was a man of, he could talk to peasants, he could talk to professors. He had time for everybody. Those women on the bus I was telling you about, oh, they would yeah. all go and sit beside me, we could talk to them all, Mrs. Jones, lovely to see you on the trip, oh, how are you, I haven't seen you for a long time. <laughs> he loved everybody in, in that respect and everybody loved him. He was a man of fierce ambition, fierce ambition, uh, and th that got up some people's noses a little bit. Oh, Joe yeah. Tomalty, for example, oh, didn't Joe, really like yeah, Hayward, yeah. he didn't really like, he felt he was jumping around too many different projects yes, and couldn't concentrate yes. on one thing. But the people loved him. Um, and they couldn't get enough of him yes. to, to, to that extent. You know, and they, they, he died they just, tragically in a road traffic accident up in Ballymena. He did, and he was going to do a talk to Ballymena Rotary Club on Irish folklore, My a goodness. lunchtime talk. His car, he had a heart attack, his car crossed the road, and he killed two other people in the, in the other car. It was a tragedy. And I've always thought, uh, well, the news, that news was recorded on the front page of every newspaper in Ireland. I've seen them all. They're in this book. But I've always thought, how ironic for a man who drove around Ireland for 40 years. He knew the back roads of Kerry. He knew them all. He traveled them up the mountains. How ironic to be killed in a car crash. My goodness. It's a tragedy. Paul, the book is in the shops now, yes? It's available in the shops Richard on the internet. Richard Hayward, it's uh, Romancing Ireland, published by Lilliput. And uh, a, a fine, fine read it is. Paul Very Clements, good. God Thank bless you. Lord. Thank you. Good to see you, mate. Welcome, welcome, Thank welcome. Thank you. Go well, take care. And it's Destination Yuri, it's the morning program. I'm Rowan Hand. It's the greatest joy that